The Sakuru was a beautiful ship, slicing through the warm waters of the shining seas as it set out from the coast of Kalimshan, riding the hot desert wind with bright red sails straining in the complicated rigging. The sailors on board scampering around the ropes and ran across mast beams fearlessly, pulling in sails and tightening ropes as we picked up considerable speed. Down below decks, I could hear the men who sat chained to the oar benches singing, relieved to not have to be rowing any more. I was free to wander from my cramped little cabin space and stood not too far from the captain, a barrel-chested man in loose, regal clothing, who studied the horizon and felt the wind like it was a living thing he was riding. He noticed me regarding him and asked me to bring him a flask of hot tea, which I did. We drank and watched the waters, and he told me of the mysterious lands of Zakara, where he was born, and told me that it was not a land of men, but that it belonged to the genies. I asked him what he knew of them, and he talked at some length about them. It seemed I had struck on an area of some interest to him, and he was very well pleased. It's always a delight to hear an expert speak on a subject that they are passionate about. He said that he had met with members of the Jan race many times. Individual Jani are impressive people. He was quite effusive in his praise of their magnetic eyes, like a fire was within them. Passion for life gives their eyes a supernatural intensity and a range of colours greater than that of humans. Their skin is the colour of golden sand or earth, and they have very tough skin, impervious to all the effects of the desert, highly resistant to flames and always much stronger than any human. Jan are composed of all four elements, air, earth, fire and water. They live for an average of 300 years, and although they are genies, they are connected to the material plane. They can still be resurrected if they die of unnatural causes. Appearing as powerfully built humans or half-elves, they stand between six and seven feet tall. Jan have innate spell-like powers, along with dark vision and great strength. They are highly intelligent and use their supernatural powers to infiltrate, acquire, and occasionally just to shock and impress. They can increase or decrease their height from as small as two inches tall, all the way up to 24 feet. They can also shrink or enlarge anyone they are touching, willing or unwilling, although the victim does get a saving throw. Jan can turn themselves invisible, create a magical gruel of bread and water that can feed people and horses or livestock. They can step out of the veil of the material plane and delve into the astral plane and into the border and deep ethereal realms. They are also able to fly and can breathe underwater at will. Flight and breathing underwater are critical skills in dealing with the Jin, whom the Jan strive to maintain a strong relationship with, often calling on the aid of the majestic air Jin in dire circumstances. They return the favour given any opportunity. The Jan don't deal very much with the Efreet and the Dao, nor do they want to, so they are not filling the streets of the City of Brass. But they do sometimes serve the Marids. This is a relatively recent development. For a very long time, the Jan treated the Marids the same as the Dao and the Efreeti. Jan, in service to air and water, still favour their flowing robes, capes, turbans and flamboyant pants. Wet or dry, the Jani is at ease in more extreme weather and conditions. Travelling the inner planes and the elemental planes, the Jan are usually protected by planet travel magic anyway. Jan are able to dwell in air, earth, fire or water environments for up to two days. This includes the elemental planes, to which the Jan can travel, even taking up to six individuals along, if those persons form a hand-holding circle with the Jan. Failure to return to the prime material plane within two days inflicts one point of damage per hour on the Jan until death occurs or return to the said plane. Travel to other elemental planes is possible, sans damage, providing at least two days were previously spent on the prime material plane immediately prior to that travel. Jan on the prime material plane are a nomadic people, but they do maintain permanent locations hidden throughout the desert. Their favourite locations for these settlements were hidden oases, ancient ruins and abandoned temples. Tents were prevalent in these locations, but the Jan also constructed beautiful buildings such as mosques, bathhouses, smokehouses and audience chambers. Normally they would be camped in bright tents guarded by the prized Saluki dogs that they breed along with exceptional goats, camels, sheep and horses. Skilled animal breeders will always have something to learn from the Jan who are happy to talk about the art. It's something they talk about among themselves all the time so animal husbandry, riding exotic animals and the trade in exotic animals is always a good choice of topic. Otherwise, Jan don't tend to talk to the mortals. In Zakara, that attitude is kind of mutual. The history of the land has taught people that genies may look a lot like humans, but they are not the same. While on the one hand, using magic, a genie can be bound supernaturally on their promises. 
On the other, a genie in service to a lesser being finds it darkly amusing to use immortals' lack of brains and caution against them, twisting any promise and ensuring the outcomes something of a nightmare for the mortal involved. It serves them right for daring to dominate a genie. A common tribe of Jan includes 10 to 30 individuals, roughly led by a sheik, who has one or two viziers. Warriors of the tribe will typically wear ornate chainmail or an ancient and very effective style of armor called lamellar, which is much more common in the lands of fate than most other places, though I can't speak for Karatur, they may have examples of it in use as well. Lamellar is similar to scale armor, made of overlapping metal plates called lamellas, connected via metal links which makes it much lighter in weight than standard scale mail and costs a lot less to produce. In Zakara, the style called Domaru, which consists of a corselet of lamellar covering the stomach, chest, shoulders and back is the most common, but there are as many versions as there are styles of fashion. The first appearance of the Jan, or as Gary Gygax called them, the Jani, was in issue 66 of Dragon Magazine, published in October 1982. They are armed with large scimitars and are able to attack with them twice per turn, plus 10 to hit one target within 5 feet and inflict 2d6 plus 6 slashing damage. Anyway, unlike the Jin, the Jan can't grant wishes, and they don't have a noble ruling class, just ordinary prominent tribes and families, going about mostly their own business with very little to do with mortals. They do respect some creatures though, including anything capable of besting them in magic, is very high on that list, and anything that can control and harm them. For example, all Zakaran genies are very cautious about the ghoulkin, but especially great ghouls. This is because the great ghouls can command genies like Sha'ir, which are human sorcerers um, of elemental power, a power which all genies highly resent them for. Given the opportunity, any genie would happily destroy a great ghoul's home whenever it was discovered. Despite all this animosity, genies occasionally have great ghouls serve them, just for the delicious irony and insult that it is. Exceptionally powerful sheiks called emirs rule the larger tribes and houses. Emirs are consoled by brilliant viziers who possess spell-like abilities. Additionally, smaller clans who are not aligned with any tribe are scattered throughout the desert. Males and females have the same status in Jan society. Both males and females can have a number of different spouses. These days, the tradition is that the married males live near the tent of their family and married women live near the tent of their spouse. So every Jan gets their own tent when they're old enough not to share with other kids or the rest of the family. Jan tend to keep immaculate care of their tents and display their wealth and pride in every part of their furnishings and attire. Like all genies, some flattery is absolutely required once you are invited into a Jani's tent. Every object on display will have a story about it and all the stories will paint the Jani who tells them in a very positive light. The more you listen to the stories, praise their truth and ask the Jani to tell you more about their heroic life, the more relaxed and generous the Jani will be. They are not only powerful and magical, they also have all sorts of connections. On the elemental planes, Jan are typically servants, mercenaries or slaves of the greater genies. However, on the Prime, they have adopted the role of guardians of the wild reaches of the world. As a whole, the Jan are physically embodiment of the desert's virtues. They are proud people who repay insults and impropriety accordingly. They are hospitable to travellers who show that they deserve the treatment and who treat the Jan with the same respect they are afforded. Jan travel between fertile lands to feed their herds and have territory that extends for hundreds of miles. They are usually friendly towards strangers within their desert territories, for the most part. They don't show preference or malcontent toward any particular race or the other, preferring to judge people based on their actions and their individual merits and flaws once they get to know them better. As with all genies, it's possible for them to become so habitualized to a set pattern of behavior that they undergo a transformation into a task genie. The Jan are not excluded from this. There are many task genies located in the lands of Zakara of Jan origin, but their origins fade from their memory as task genies. It's a part of the genie psyche that is so alien to mortal humanoids. Jan see the mortals with souls as sort of naturalized outsider creatures of a mixed spiritual and physical nature. The Jan are elemental. They can be returned from death with divine magic if they wish to return from pure elemental spirit form. They see dragons in the opposite way. Dragons are elemental spirits within mortal but powerful bodies made up of the prime material plane. No part of a dragon is bound to a divine or infernal outer plane. They don't have a heaven or hell to go to when they die. Their elemental spirit becomes part of the new strata of the prime material plane. 
the same way the genies do. The same way they can be pulled back from this state and resurrected from the dead is exactly the same for Jan genies. Therefore, the two species must get along, right? Both creatures of magic, all about ego and ownership and such. <laughs> oh, hell no. Dragons and genies... If it were not for the giants, the dragons would have invariably started a massive war with the genies. And even now, there's almost no dragons present in the lands of fate. They're also less common in Kalimshan, as the genies are much more active there and have quite a lot of history with the regions around the Shining Sea and the central regions of Tether, Arm and Termish. It's odd, really. The further south you go, the more you realise that it is in fact genies, not dragons, who control the greater portion of Toril's land masses. The strong impression one has learning mostly about northern Faerun, is that dragons are thick in numbers all over the place. This is not actually true. The role and number and type of dragons found along the Sword Coast and around the lands of the Sea of Fallen Stars is more similar to what you would normally find on planets or regions without a lot of genie activity. For a very long time, the giants were a dominant force with a powerful pantheon who mastered a lot of the elemental magic and made life pretty difficult for the genies. So they just stayed down south. In other words, if it were not for the activity of dragons, giants, and particularly the gods of the outer plains, planet Toril would most likely be controlled by genies. This is, of course, a topic of slow but heated debate among sages who take interest in global politics and history. Something very difficult to study or even gain any sort of mastery of on Toril. We don't even have a map for one of the major continents on the planet. It's hardly like anyone has a complete and accurate book of history or even a sharp grasp of current events. In Zakara, genies are the age-old enemies of that region's jungle, reef, island, desert and ogre giants. For these true giants, distant kin of the true giants of Faerun, once ruled much of the land and over time there have been many clashes between genie and giants that led to a steady decline in the giant's population. Genies refuse to recognise the traditions of these giants and don't talk about them at all, considering them unimportant these days in the larger scheme of things. Zakaran giants in turn refuse to give genies tribute or sacrifice and will not acknowledge them as superior to the giants themselves. Giants are not in the habit of seeing reason in that regard anyway. Genies are sometimes bound to magic items and forced to serve others. Examples of these items include a ring of genie summoning, a lamp of genie summoning, an astrolabe of entrapment. All genies resent that kind of enslavement, of course, and they do fight against it. It's possible to free a genie trapped within this kind of magical servitude by either destroying the device binding them or using a wish to free the genie. Genies freed from this imprisonment are almost always incredibly grateful to whoever freed them, although they typically don't hang around for long once set free. When you see that tasked genies can be transformed into such by being magically forced to perform the same task over and over again to inhuman levels of concentration and endurance, this is why all genies fear being entrapped within magical items bound to mortal masters or commanded by Shair, night hags and great ghouls. The more powerful genies have enormous willpower. Although Jan can't grant wishes, they often attain peculiar magic items and employ rare specialized spells. In addition to their innate spell powers, many train to gain spellcasting abilities like a sorcerer's pathway dedicated to one of the four elements. The Jan get to choose and attain further damage resistance to that element. All Jan are basically super adapted to living on the prime material plane. I know this sounds odd, but they are more at home on a planet than they are on an elemental plane. They're also far more comfortable in harsh deserts, the bottom of a frozen lake, the peak of a mountain, the dank and teeming environment of a tropical swamp. They are made of elements, not the same way we are, but in a more raw and direct form. Their vitality is based more on elemental power which their body contains and flows with, while our bodies extract power from materials we take in and the energy from that flows through us. A mortal is aware of the world through taking in energy. A genie is aware of the world through feeling the flow of that energy which they form a part of. So their connection to the world is far more integral and they find gathering and directing that energy can be an innate process as natural to them as breathing. Not many mortals reach a point of mastery of energy that they can sense the world in the same way. Liches, Grand Master Monks, and the occasional Scion certainly do. Demigods tend to have that connection via their divine will impacting the morphic traits of the world around them. In a nutshell, when playing a genie, assume they are using prestidigitation all the time. 
and that they can sense the use of magic just like we can sense someone lighting up some incense or igniting a lantern. They can strongly sense conjuration and evocation magics going off but won't be able to sense that spell of that type being cast because they don't pay as much attention to the nature of Mistra's magical weave. They would much prefer a world without a weave. To them, it's nothing but divine hubris and interference with their property. To the gods, genies exist. They can be useful. They save the ass of the multiverse and the ancient battles between lore and chaos. But genies have no real place with the gods. They're not really that welcome in the outer planes. And the genies feel intensely uncomfortable in such places anyway. Over an enormous amount of time, the gods and genies have come to terms with one another. Neither of them is going anywhere and conflict would be pointless. So while a genie may rage and hurl insults at the sky and blow up the occasional shrine in a fit of mood, the gods don't take this too seriously. It's like what the genie gets up to in the confines of its own home is not the gods' concern. I'll be talking more about the Jan, their culture, and particularly the task genies coming up, but next a relatively simple creature native to the southern lands, not so common in the north, requested by a Patreon supporter. Remember, channel members, Subscribestar and Patreon supporters, you are members of the glorious Gluminati. You can email me or message me at any time, suggest video topics, ask campaign planning advice. My door is always open. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Apologies for the lack of regular uploads this last week. Uh, those of you who have a sharp ear can probably hear it in my voice, but under the weather. Still fine though. I actually did a lot of um, broadcasting on other people's channels. So you can go and check my community tab and you'll find links to that stuff.